Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo and Cryptids Encounter Stories. First Story, Wendigo Experience. So my name is Nicholas and I'm 14 and I always believed in paranormal anomalies and such. I live in Canada so Bigfoot and Wendigo are my favorite paranormal beings. But I'm not afraid of them because I'm a Christian and go to a Christian school. So last year I went to a Bible camp. They had canoeing, shooting bottles, making shelters, and church. It's fun and I decided to take the outdoor fun week. So we got to the camp it had a cafeteria bunk bed cabins, and more it was not fenced, and was close together which made me feel safe. So after my first night we decided to play Fugitive. It's a game where you have two cops and one main fugitive when you come in two feet of a person they must give you a hint to where the main fugitive is they only have three arrests which are hints. So I got picked for main fugitive and started running into the woods to find a hiding place we all had radios to make sure we were safe I found a pine tree which I climbed up and hid and they had five minutes to find me. Two minutes and I hear my cabin master say game over come back form in the woods not on the radio which is odd but I listened and went into the deeper part of the woods and when I heard him say Nicholas come in the game is over I ran towards the voice and then the radio beeped. Fugitive was not found come back to the cafeteria for lunch I froze in my place thinking what is happening at this point I was crying and then I heard sticks breaking and teeth chattering like echo location or something of that sort and I remembered Winijo's toy with people or their prey and I made the decision to run as fast as I could to the cafeteria I started running fast as I could I was feeling weak but my heart was in my throat and I heard leaves behind me rustle and I finally get to the cafeteria and tell my friends and cabin master what happened and I got my parents to come and pick me up and I went home and to this day I don't go to Bible camp in fear of what that Wendigo or thing would do to me. Also I live in the Northwest Territories where the Wendigo is a common occurrence and such of the sort I'm glad to share my story and it is real but it's fine if you don't think it is. I believe God saved me that day. But anyways have a good day or night. Second Story we survived a Wendigo attack. I'm happy to see others also had these experiences. It's a bit like group therapy, in a very, twisted way I guess. This isn't an AA meeting or anything. Years ago, when I was fresh out of high school, me and my friends went for a camping trip, since it'd be the last time we saw each other before college sent us on our separate ways. We had planned to go deep into the national forest in the mountains, and just enjoy ourselves for a few weeks. My friends who came along were Preston, a Native American who had several years of survivalist strategies under his belt. Jamie, a hunting and gun enthusiast like me, with a propensity for adventure. Mark, Preston's friend, not so much mine. He smoked a lot of drugs and seemed to be okay, but I was always on edge around him. With us we packed two tents, dried fruit, rice, jerky, camping supplies, and beer, along with a mini, 14 rifle a saiga, 12 shotgun 2 pistols, my Taurus Judge revolver, and Jamie's .357 revolver. We packed all of this into my battered BMW station wagon, with me being the driver. Stopping at a car park, we loaded up our gear on our backs and began going deep into the forest. The first day was uneventful. Preston found a good clearing for us to settle at. We set down our gear and set up the tents while Preston got to work with a cook fire. I was always good at setting up tents, so this wasn't a problem for me. Within 20 minutes, we had set up the basics of camp. I cracked open a beer and sat next to Preston, who had created a roaring fire. I smiled at him. I'm gonna miss you, man. I patted his back. Me too. Let's enjoy this, he responded. Jamie and Mark were carrying on, exploring the surrounding area. At the time, I could have sworn I saw a pair of green eyes and antlers looking at me. I would come to regret not asking Preston in the coming days. I tried to forget as we sat down to dinner that night. Campfire curry, a mix of curry spices, frozen chicken we brought and prepared, and a few vegetables, along with a small pot of rice. As it was the first night, we ate all of our perishables. It was tasty for sure. Then, like we were kids once again, we roasted marshmallows and made s'mores. It was truly a very fun time, for sure. If only it would have lasted. That night was uneventful as well. I slept like a baby in Preston, whom I shared a tent with, didn't seem to be bothered at all. The next morning, we packed up camp and decided to head south, towards a large river with the intent of spending a few nights riverside. As we were in the remote wilderness, I handed Preston my Mini, 14, and I myself carried the Saiga, 
12, slugs and buckshot alternated in its 10-round magazine. Jamie kept his .357, and I had my sidearm as well. We walked for what seemed like hours. The mistiness, overcast weather, and lack of clear landmarks required we rely on GPS and compasses. As we headed south, I saw the look on Preston's face. He looked worried. Preston, what's up man? I asked him. He had me get close and he whispered, I dunno man, I got a feeling that a bad omen is about to pass. Keep everyone in sight. I'll listen for anything. As he said that, we heard what sounded like a distant whooping noise. All of us looked around. In the distance behind us, I could have sworn I saw something shambling. It was too far to shoot with my shotgun. So I pointed at it and told Preston to shoot. Shoot that thing. Three shots from the Mini, 14, and the smell of freshly fired ammunition filled my nostrils. Whatever it was got down on all fours and bounded away. What was that? Mark asked, shocked. Preston swore up and down in his native language, before he finally said, that, my friends, is something truly evil. We need to hurry to the river. We ran for about 30 minutes, our pace slowed by the amount of heavy gear we carried. Preston looked from side to side, but found nothing as he did so. Soon, we reached the rushing river, and with that the fog seemed to dissipate. Preston looked around, shook his head, looked at his GPS and finally said, the other side of the National Forest is available to us across a hand tram a mile upstream. We can make it there before lunchtime if we hurry. Preston, what's going on? What was that thing? Jamie asked, concerned. I can't be sure, but it's nothing good. I want to try and lose it across the tramway. Whatever that thing is, if it's anything like my family stories, it won't ford a river. We're going, that's final. Preston led the way upriver, keeping close to the shoreline. Eventually, we did find it. A large steel and wood car suspended over a wide expanse of river. I got in first and wasted no time getting across. I watched the trail on the other side while Jamie went across next with some of the extra gear, and then finally Preston and Mark squeezed into the tram and got across. As I turned to leave, I saw Preston take out his bowie and he began hacking at the rope suspending the tram. What the fuck are you doing, man? That's state property. That's a felony. I said, bewildered. We can't have that thing follow us. He hacked at the rope until it snapped and the tram car fell with a loud clang into the river below. As we left and started heading east, I could have sworn I saw those green eyes again, but just for a moment, watching us. We made camp at a clearing on the edge of a hill's wide ridge. It gave us great views and visibility, but more importantly, as Preston stated, we can see anyone or anything coming. As he sat and made the fire he said, we're doing watch rotations. That thing, I am genuinely afraid of it. I bet it's just a bear Preston. Too many family stories. Mark guffawed. As I said previously, he was Preston's, not my friend. I took the second watch, after Preston cooked a meal of rice pudding. I had no trouble staying up. Then Jamie. I sat up and talked with him for a while. He worried a little, and he expressed that he wanted to go home. I know what you mean, dude. This is too creepy. Mark took the last watch, my shotgun propped up next to the tin in case he needed it. Or so Jamie told me. When we got up the next morning, Mark had disappeared. Immediately, we questioned Jamie, whose story checked out. He saw Mark up and watching. We waited, Preston reigniting the few vapors. He also pulled out a small can of pine tar and began making torches. What are they for, Preston? Jamie asked. I'm sure of it. We've got a Wendigo. Preston replied. A Wendigo? The fuck is that? I replied. A cannibalistic demon with green eyes, a deer skull for a head, and a thirst for human blood. They're also like skinwalkers, you know, like in True Blood? At the time, the TV show was popular. He explained. I became very scared. So that grabbed Mark and ate him? We'll wait for Mark for a few hours. Keep the guns locked and loaded. Do not let him approach within 200 feet of the campsite. I'm going out for a bit. You're crazy, Preston. I protested. He whispered in my ear. When I come back, ask me my favorite sailor. It's Saturn, for the record. He then approached Jamie and told him something that I knew I wasn't supposed to hear. Then he grabbed two torches, his knife, and he turned back to us. Wendigo do not like fire. Keep the fire going. 
There's plenty of sticks and would right there for a few hours. I'll be back. Do not forget what I told each of you. If I can't answer it when I come back, shoot me. As he disappeared into the forest, I sat with Jamie, back to back. He had my Saiga. I had my Mini, 14. For hours, we heard various sounds in the forest, including those whooping noises, the sound of what sounded like Mark, and what I thought was the sound of a distantly beating drum. By afternoon, we heard rustling in the forest, and none other than Preston returned, dirt smeared on his face, and a makeshift drum under his arm, with one torch left. He stopped short of the campsite when I raised my gun at him. What's this about guys? It's me, Preston, he said. What, is your favorite Final Fantasy protagonist? Jamie asked. Squall, of course. Jamie lowered his gun. What is your favorite sailor? I asked slowly and deliberately. Saturn, of course. I suppose this means Mark is still missing, yes? He responded. I lowered my gun and said, Come on up, dude. And yeah, we heard whooping noises but no sign. Preston averted his gaze. It's hunting us. I confirmed the tracks, and my little serenade and tribal chants caused it to at one point come and look at me. How did you get away? I asked. I chased it with fire. They're afraid of it, remember? He responded. Do guns harm them? I asked slowly. It can injure them, but you really need fire or silver. We only have fire, as usual. We're going to burn one of the tents and drop some gear. We're going light. We're heading to the highway. It's 35 miles to the east, but we can get there over two days. But we'll need to double our night rotations. And if you see anything that looks like Mark, he's dead guys. I'm sure of it. Preston responded. I was very afraid at this point. The sinking feeling that my idea could have gotten everyone killed. I took charge. We will do 15 miles today, and 20 tomorrow. We will hitch a ride back to the car. We'll burn our trash as we move. We'll burn the tent tomorrow morning. Let's go now. We hastily packed what we could carry, and burned much of our non-essentials. We hurried throughout the afternoon and early evening, running when we could and walking as quickly as we could. The whooping call continued to seem to follow us at a distance. I didn't, however, see antlers or green eyes when I looked back. Eventually, we found a clearing that was decently sized, had good visibility and sticks. We hastily gathered firewood, all staying as a group, and we pitched camp. That dinner was cold jerky and dried fruit. Preston was unwilling to attract attention from smells, but he did create several pine tar torches and set them at the outskirts. We didn't say a word, but me and Preston took the first watch. Then Jamie and Preston, then me and Jamie. This continued every two hours until the daytime. As day broke, we heard screaming. Mark's voice came from the woods crying for help. Preston shook his head. It got him. We can't do anything about it. We burned that tent and continued traveling throughout the day. I could see it. Today, though, it didn't bother to hide itself by noon. The Wendigo was about seven feet tall. Its limbs were blackened, two glowing green eyes set into a deer skull with antlers. Soft whooping noises. It kept its distance. I pulled my revolver and aimed at it, about 250 feet away. Firing, I hit it in the chest. It barely flinched. The thing turned and stared at me. Preston began to shout at it aggressively in his native language. It stopped, tilted its head, and then responded to him. I asked him, what the hell did he say to you? I asked him what he did with Mark. He responded, who's that? Preston then grabbed my mini, 14 and fired repeatedly at him. This abomination seemed to get annoyed. I followed up with a well-placed slug to the chest from my saiga. It howled in pain and dashed away into the woods. We better run, I think. I remarked to the group. We ran for a good 20 minutes, when suddenly, in a clearing ahead of us, was a human silhouette. Naked. Filthy. Guys, it's me. You gotta take me back. I escaped that thing and have been running from it for the last day. It was Mark. I pointed my saiga at Mark. What happened to your clothes, Mark? Yeah, and if you're Mark, tell us the name of the school we went to. Preston said. He pointed the rifle at his head. Come on guys don't play around. It's me. I'm cold. I'm hungry and I want to go home, he protested. Jamie shoot him in the leg with his revolver. Mark screamed in pain. Unless you want the next to be your head, 
Answer the fucking questions. Jamie shouted. That's when Mark's head snapped to Jamie. In a grossly unnatural fashion. I was paralyzed by fear as it appeared as if Mark was contorting and screaming in unnatural tones. I fired. Repeatedly. All remaining shells in the magazine. It just seemed to shred the upper skin. Putting that on my back, I remembered. Wendigos hate fire. I grabbed my lighter and a can of bug spray, and I dashed at the thing that was once Mark, spraying it with the fire from my makeshift flamethrower. As I burned it, Preston laid down two entire magazines into it, and then dumped the rest of his pine tar on it, and Jamie emptied his revolver. When it finally stopped screaming and moving, we were left with a mutilated and charred corpse, half Mark, half Wendigo. We all threw up. Preston began to butcher its corpse and said, I've got to destroy the corpse. It's only right that I do this. For an hour, Preston burned and cut up the corpse, then cut the heart out. He put it in a plastic bag and then shoved it into his jacket. It took us another few hours to reach the highway. Preston sat and began to cry on the sidewalk as Jamie kept a hitchhiker thumb out. I sat next to him and asked, What are you going to do with the heart? I have to take it to the reservation. There. My elders have to know these things are still out there. And we need to protect those from these monsters. We. He clenched his fist. I'll wipe them out by myself if I have to. For Mark. By evening, a sympathetic farmer stopped and let us ride his bed into town. From there I paid for a cheap motel room, where we breathed a few sighs of relief. The next day, we returned to my car. Thankfully, it started, and we left the area around the forest easily. I didn't talk to Preston for several weeks after that. He eventually showed up at my house during the summer and asked my father if he could stay the night at the time. I still was living at home. My dad obliged. Preston told me that the elders were shocked and told him that they'd amass a party and take care of it. They came back with the skull of two Wendigos and six hearts. They also found scraps of Mark's t-shirt, surrounded by a pile of decaying gore. To this day, Preston, Jamie and me have had a pact to never tell anyone about the horror we witnessed. I only break this pact now, years later, and because we can safely say that this is behind us, for the present. My advice. If you hear whooping noises and see green eyes and antlers, run or fight it with fire. Guns can cause it pain, but only fire or silver can kill it. I pray that the abominations are wiped out one day, but I know in my heart that won't happen. Be safe everyone. Third Story Strange Experiences in the Woods of NJ I'm not really much of a Reddit user, but I've been reading some creepy slash unexplained stories for the past hour or so. So I thought I'd share some experiences of my own. When I was young, from birth until about age 11 or 12, I lived in a rural part of northern New Jersey, and our house was in the middle of the woods. So basically there wasn't anyone around but my parents, my brother, and myself. Both my parents worked during the day, and in the summer months, my brother and I would stay home alone until my mother came home in the early afternoon. I used to play a lot around the outside of the house, in the garden, in the woods, so on. At the time I had a few experiences, which now make me shudder to think about. Several times I'd be out playing, and I would feel small objects hitting me on the back and my legs. Sometimes I'd see little pebbles on the ground, or they would be caught up in my shirt slash jacket. It would weird me out a bit, so I'd just go inside. I wouldn't say it happened regularly, but it happened on more than one occasion. The other strange experience was I was outside, just playing around with sticks and hitting them on rocks and things. After a while, I noticed that I could hear similar sounds coming from a ways off into the trees. I drum out a pattern, listen quietly, and hear a reply. I must have done this for several minutes, before getting creeped out and going inside. The older I got, the more uneasy I felt about the experiences and so I stopped going out alone. Eventually we moved to a house in the center of town, and that was the end of it. Recently, since watching shows like Finding Bigfoot, I've learned that supposedly Sasquatch throw things and hit sticks on trees, but I can't say I ever saw anything. Oh, and you might ask where my brother was during all this. He was pretty obsessed with Nintendo, so that pretty much kept him occupied. Fourth Story Skinwalker Sighting in Central Scotland Okay, First off, I know a lot of people will think that this is a hoax because it's in Scotland, but I don't know how to explain this. I'm extremely familiar with Wendigos, Skinwalkers, Fleshgates, all that crap, 
and there's probably a not Native American possibility that I'm unaware of, but the only explanation to me is a skinwalker. I apologize for my use of Scots slang in advance. I'm a teenager, won't disclose age, and I go to a public high school in Perthshire, Scotland. It's mostly a rural area, with mostly towns, villages, and just houses dotting the landscape. Although there are two major cities in my area, the high school I go to is in a medium-ish sized town, and for privacy reasons, I will not disclose its name. Not many people have had many paranormal encounters, although a few people claim to have seen ghosts and whatnot. Anyways, on to my encounter. I live in a largish house in the middle of a field with my family. It's not too far from the town I go to school in, but I usually take the bus and just cause I'm a lazy git. Sometimes, me and my mates, let's call them E, J and C, take a path through a nearby forest to come back to my place, where we just play video games, that sort of shit. This particular night, my parents were out of town, and we decided to drink a bit of booze that we had in the mini-fridge in my room. I didn't try much, I'm not much of a drinker, and beer's not my thing, or C's, really. E and J, however, they went all out. It got really late, or rather, early, and they decided to leave and head home. I said bye to them then headed back up to my room to play some more video games. About half an hour later, I heard a loud banging on my door. It was J and E. I let them in, and they started panicking. C goes home a different way to them. He lives a bit closer to me than the others. E and J said that they were walking through the woods and they saw a tall, skinny-looking bloke pelting it towards them. They panicked and legged it back to my house, while the skinny fella gave chase. My mind went back to when another friend, somewhat of a paranormal buff, told me about Wendigos and skinwalkers. I called 999 and said that a prowler was lurking around our house and had chased my mates back to my house. I gave the operator my address and said that they'd have a car or two to my house in an hour and a half. Apparently there was a big traffic incident. In the meantime, she said, arm yourselves, lock all doors and windows and lock yourself in a room. We did that, grabbing knives from the kitchen and barricading ourselves inside my bedroom. After a while, we heard heavy footsteps around our house and thinking it was the police. I peered out of the window. What I saw was much worse. It was E. It looked exactly the same as her. I knew that she was sitting crying in my room. I freaked out and it saw me. WH at the HELISS the ATANG. Whatever the fuck was outside could speak. And it sounded exactly like J. It was a skinwalker. I remember the description from my horror weirdo friend. It looked like my friend, but sounded like my other friend. It must have been confused, and that made it scarier. We heard sirens and the thing ran off into the woods. We told the police officers everything, and they checked it out. The officers left, after saying the woods were clear, then muttered something about fucking prank callers. After they left, we heard an inhuman shriek, but sort of human-like. We didn't sleep at all that night. I believe that what we saw was a skinwalker. I hope to God Almighty that I never have to face that bloody thing again. However, if I do, I shall make a follow-up. Thank you. Fifth story. Strange creature in the woods. I had gone down to visit my friend at his college, in Virginia, US. We had hung out on campus until like 3 a.m. and decided to go on a walk. We walked through along a path and wound up in some woods. My friend insisted that this was a shortcut back to campus. We entered the woods and walked for about half a mile, only with our phone flashlights. Just as we crested the hill I saw something. Originally I thought it was a white owl sitting on a brand of a rotten tree trunk. However, as we walked closer my curiosity turned to horror as it was clear it was not an owl. About 20 yards from us, a white face peeked around the tree. Its face looked as it was made out of old bone, slightly yellowed and cracked. Its shape was like a mix between a human's and an elk's or horse's. Its eyes were sunken and black and looked like it had charcoal dust rubbed around them. It had no mouth, no nose. I stopped and tried to get my friend to look. That's when it peered around the stump. Its long black arm pulled it around as if to get a better look at us. Its fingers were long and thin, like spider legs. It tilted its head and wrapped its other arm around the tree. I grabbed my friend's arm and sprinted in the other direction. I have searched online for weeks looking for anything that describes the creature I saw. The only thing I can compare it to is the Wendigo. However, the Wendigo is usually found farther north. If anyone has any insight, 
it would much be appreciated. Shit still keeps me from wandering into the woods at night. Sixth story. I heard him at my window. I need to explain two things before I tell this story. First I have a sleep disorder, and I've had it my whole life. I sleepwalk. Nothing too dramatic. Mostly just do everyday things while sleeping. Open the fridge. Put clothes in the washer without starting it. Take the vacuum out of the closet and set it in the middle of the room and leave. That sort of thing. When I was younger this was an every night occurrence, but now in my late thirties, this is a once slash twice a year thing. Second I am native. I have a healthy respect for the stories of spirits my ancestors told. Many hunting trips I would sit around the fire with my dad listening to him tell stories of the tricks Wendigo play to try to lure you to them. While I'm unsure if I believe the stories of skinwalkers and Wendigo, I don't tend to mess around. Just. In. Case. Shoot to roughly three weeks ago. My husband and I both work construction, we have hard, long and rewarding days. Once dinner is over and planning for the next day is complete, the dogs have been taken out for the last time. Our heads hit the pillows and it's lights out until the alarm sounds. We sleep like the dead. Pretty sure a war could break out in our bedroom. Thundering tanks and all, and we would sleep right through it wondering in the morning where all the holes in the walls came from. Our bedroom is fairly good sized and has a small bay window in the corner. My husband liked to sleep with fresh air, so he takes the window side of the bed. This particular night though something woke me up. I never wake up. Dogs were quiet. Typical northwest weather. Rain quietly taping away. No thunder. No heavy winds. I looked the dark and quiet room over and nothing was out of place. The only noise besides the rain was my husband's box fan gently humming away. I was confused but decided to adjust my blankets, flip my pillow, and go back to sleep. As I closed my eyes and took a deep breath to relax I heard my husband, Babe, babe, come out here and give me a hand with the boys. Confused and still foggy from being woken from a deep sleep a few seconds earlier I opened my eyes to the pitch black of the room again. Rarely one of our three dogs will need to go out at night, and if one goes they all will go. We live in an incredibly rural area, and it's easy for them to get lost in the dark woods. Not a good thing when you have bears, coyotes, cougars, and whatever else on your property. Babe. Babe. Can you come out here and help me with the boys? He called again, voice right against the half-open window, not concerned, just demanding. Annoyed and groggy, I leaned up propping myself up on a stiff pile of blankets to look at the window. It was too dark to see him. The floodlight is on the other side of the house. Babe. Come outside, my husband demanded. It was the third beckon that bothered me. He was never that pushy. If something was wrong, one of the dogs wandered off he would say that. It's happened before he would something like, come watch these two real quick I can't find Murph, something like that. Something wasn't right. I was regaining my focus and shaking off the sleepies, quite awake at this point. I knew it was him. My husband has a very distinct voice. He's a Sicilian from Queens and has a very deep, unintentionally loud voice. It was at that moment, staring out the black window I realized I wasn't leaning on a pile of blankets. The pile of blankets was breathing. I was leaning on my sleeping husband listening to him call to me from outside the window. Babe, come outside. The voice came again from the window. I put my hand down on my husband's face. He was there, asleep next to me. But his voice, or what I thought was him, was at the window. I laid down next to him, very very close to him, and closed my eyes very tight. In moments like these, I'm the type to just try and pretend it's not happening. I didn't hear it again and spent the next half of the night trying to fight off the spookies and had at some point finally fell asleep. I told my husband about it the next morning after his, oh my god you look like death, comment, I hadn't slept well. He laughed it off as I had, probably had a creepy sleepwalking thing. Thing is, when I have a sleepwalking event, I remember nothing. I don't recall dreaming, walking, or anything from those nights no matter how hard I try. It's like a blackout. I am sure I was awake for this. Every time I think of it these past few weeks I remember those hunting trips, poking coals around in the fire with a stick while my dad tells his serious yet animated tales of Wendigo tricks to get you to come to them. I know it sounds crazy but I think there's a Wendigo in my woods. Seventh story. I hunted the Wendigo that ate my sister. Last summer my younger sister went missing on a camping trip with friends. She had just turned 20 and we had started to drift away from each other. 
I'd gotten busy focusing on my own life. I left the country for a new job. When I came back at Christmas, I found out she had gone missing. It explained why she hadn't been answering my messages. I didn't understand why no one contacted me about her disappearance. The police claimed to not have my new number and didn't have access to her phone. I was certain her friends didn't want me knowing because they had time getting their stories straight. I asked for a leave from work to track down those four friends. They all claimed that she had gotten up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom and no one noticed she hadn't come back until the morning. I didn't buy it. They all set a slightly different location from where they camped that night. None of them gave collaborating details about the campsite. One said they used logs for seats. Another said the entire area was clear. They were lying where they had set up camp, and it caused the search team to be looking in the wrong place. I passed along the information, but since it was still winter, the rangers couldn't search the forest. They promised when the weather got better, they would try looking in other popular camping areas in case the four just got confused. Her friends smartened up and refused to speak with me. Threats of lawyers started. I couldn't do anything else but go back to work and wait till spring. I got the call at work that she had been found. Well, parts of her had been found. A man who had been panning for gold found some finger bones in the river. Soon with more people going into the forest for the season, more pieces started to be discovered. In total, half her skull, some ribs, and the finger bones were discovered. There had been some larger bones that hadn't yet been fully tested to find out if they were hers. It may sound gruesome, but I demanded photos of each piece found. I felt as if the police weren't doing their job. They closed the case saying she had just gotten lost. They claimed the damage to the skull could have happened after death. After I saw a photo of the femur, I doubted that fact. The marrow had been scrapped out. There also were scratches on the bone the police said were made by animals. It did appear to have been gnawed on, but not by sharp teeth. Our parents died when I was 17, and she was 14. When it happened, I promised to take care of her. I failed her. I assumed since she became an adult, I was no longer needed. I was wrong. If I couldn't save her the least I could do is find out what happened. Too many things weren't adding up. I quit my job even though my boss said I could come back anytime. He's lost a child. So he understood how grief worked. I did some research and packed what was needed. Then I drove to a small town by the forest looking for answers. I questioned some of the local shop workers trying to find out what happened before the group went into the woods. Apparently, my sister had become friends with those four locals she camped with. It was the first time they met in person but talked a lot online. I asked if there was a reason why they suddenly decided to go camping. Anyone I spoke with suddenly started to avert their eyes, as if they knew more but didn't admit to it. There was an odd air about this town. Everyone appeared as if they were trying to cover up a darkness with fake smiles. After my short investigation, I headed over to the ranger's station. I've spoken with them on the phone before, but I figured I would press my luck trying to get more information if they couldn't just hang up. Only two people were inside the small ranger station. An older man who was double my size but I bet he was still fit enough to do his job. A younger woman who looked like she may be his daughter walked around the desk to greet me. She was extra friendly and reminded me a little of my sister. I'm Dustin Hill. I've spoken to Ranger Dan before. I said and her face dropped a little. Her smile was strained once she knew who I was. The other ranger didn't get up from his chair. His face was half hidden by a large local newspaper. He flipped the pages trying to ignore me. I have no news for you. He said not even looking up. I wondered if he could feel my glare at the back of his head. The younger women looked between us in distress, unsure of what to say. May I have a map of my sister's last location? I'm not from the area and I don't want to get lost. The older ranger sighed and stood up. He sorted through some papers and grabbed a trail map. At least he was patient telling me which path to take and how long the hike would be. He had nothing personally against me. He just wished I accepted my sister was gone and there was nothing I could do about it. I refuse to believe that fact. It's been a full season. I'm not sure what you think you might find. The female ranger said innocently. Anything? I told her and put away the map provided. I'll be staying in the forest for a while. Ranger Dan Frowunet. He crossed his arms disproving of my plan. Instead of trying to stop me, he gave me a single piece of advice. Bring a gun. I stopped at the doorway to let what he said sink in. Sure, there were bears in the area, 
but no one had been killed by one in over five years. I nodded silently accepting the help. He must have some sort of unknown reason for acting so short with me. If I only knew what that was, I may be closer to finding out what happened to my sister. I would discover this town's secret sooner than I thought. It was too late in the day to start at the campsite. I rented a motel room planning to set out in the morning. After it got dark, I put on my jacket to go outside for a quick smoke. I've been quitting on and off since my parents died. A figure pacing out by my window was also the reason why I decided to head outside. I startled the female ranger from earlier in the day. She had been trying to work up the courage to knock. She almost left when she saw me. It took her a moment to collect herself. It would be pointless going to that campsite. She told me. It is because my sister was never there? I asked her. Her lips tightened showing that was the truth. She chewed on the inside of her cheek, not wanting to continue speaking. Yes. I hated lying. Where they really went is complicated. I don't think taking a hike is overly complicated. Tell me. I pressed after I lit a cigarette. My voice had grown cold after my sister died. I only cared about finding out the cause and nothing more. I think my harsher demeanor unnerved a lot of people. They went to Rosethorn Cabin. It's a local legend around here. She started. My sister had always liked ghost stories and urban legends. She didn't know what she wanted to do as a career yet. The last I heard she held down a few part-time jobs while trying to figure out the rest of her life. Had she come here because she wanted to write about legends? She had always been good at writing. Ten years ago, the two children of the mayor went to their cabin late in the season. A massive snowstorm hit. From what I heard there was a misunderstanding where they were staying. It was a month before anyone figured out they were stranded in the cabin. When a small rescue team arrived, they found the son in good health, but the daughter was nowhere to be found. She let the implications sink in. It was a tragedy that didn't need to happen. But what does the death of a girl ten years ago have to do with my sister? So? No offense, but I don't care what happened to them. I harshly said. After what happened the mayor tried to pay people to keep quiet. The son went back into the woods to live in the cabin. Some people say it was to get away from people accusing him of a crime, but others claim something else. That he, uh, became a wendigo. She almost looked embarrassed saying the word. I've heard about them in passing. I wasn't into myths as much as my sister. All I knew about them was that you could become one if you ate human flesh. And for some odd reason, they had antlers and a lot of images people made of them. Why do they think that beyond the suggestion he ate his sister to stay alive? Did he start acting weird? Did he look weird? I questioned. He disappeared from the cabin after the first winter. People claim to see a pale, thin, wild man living in the woods. A few campers have gone missing only to have their bones to be found, but, with the marrow gone, as if something had eaten it. She paused to rub her arms as if she had gotten a chill. She also started looking around expecting someone to be listening to our conversation. I didn't believe in the whole Wendigo idea, but I would consider the Rosethorn son to have gone insane. She pulled out some papers from her back pocket and held them out for me to take. I'm sorry about your sister. Her death should not have happened. The mayor has since become a powerful politician. He's done everything in his power to ensure it's not well known that his son might be living in the woods killing and eating people. Even if you find evidence that proves your sister was murdered by our local Wendigo, you may never be able to get the truth out there. Still, I made you a map of how to get to the cabin. I hope you find what you're looking for. I thanked her for the help, truly glad someone in this town was willing to tell me the truth. She soon left not wanting to be caught. People of this town thought there was a monster in the woods. They had been tight-lipped for my safety. I finished smoking and then went back inside the small motel room ready to try and get some rest. I would need it for the hike the next day. I checked out in the morning. I wasn't the best at reading maps, but this one was simple enough to understand. The trails up to the cabin weren't marked. They almost had been grown over due to lack of use. I needed to take a few breaks because my pack was too heavy. My job had always been in an office. I wasn't used to hiking. My body hated every moment, but I forced myself to carry on. I found the cabin a few hours before sunset. My stomach hurt from stress and hunger. I did listen to the ranger's advice. A small handgun that had once belonged to my father was holstered on my hip. We'd only gone shooting together once. After my sister disappeared, I went to the range to practice. 
Each time I imagined the target to be a bear or a shadow figure attacking her. It helped me improve quickly, but it didn't bring her back. No matter what I did, she would always be gone. The cabin was barely standing. The wood had rotted the elements without being maintained for so long. For some reason, the forest was quiet. The closer I got to the cabin the less I heard the birds in the trees. Dark clouds covered the sun giving the entire area an unsettling look. Soon droplets of rain started to come down. I didn't plan on staying inside the cabin. I went inside to avoid the rain wondering if the weather would get so bad that it would force me to sleep inside for the night. The floorboards creaked with every step. Soon the rain and wind outside got so heavy it felt like the small cabin started to shake. It was a tiny space. There was only a living area with a small bathroom. No furniture remained. Only a rusted useless stove. At least the fireplace still worked. It took a few minutes to get the fire going. Then I took out my flashlight trying to see better in the gray light. The wooden floors were less rotten inside. There were some odd spots where someone had scrubbed them as clean as the old wood could be. I got down low to run my fingertips over old scratches on the floor. Tracing my fingers over them, I realized they looked to be made by something with four claws. For an hour I crawled over the floor desperately looking for anything. A scrap of fabric, or some blood stains. I needed proof that my sister had been here. Just before I gave up my light, caught something between the cracks of the floorboards. I used my Swiss army knife and carefully lifted the small object out from between the two boards. When it was in my hand my heart nearly stopped from pain. I held a small silver letter charm. When my sister graduated, I bought her a bracelet that you could add charms to. The first one was an L for Lexi. She hated going by Alex but as a big brother, I used her full name to annoy her. I gave her the bracelet to apologize for not respecting her name and promise to be better. I expected to get emotional finding something of hers. I'd been almost numb since I heard about her disappearance. Even thinking her name almost felt to be too much. But now, I only felt a deep heat inside my chest. The charm was put away somewhere safe. I didn't care if whatever was in the woods was a wendigo, or a guy who just lost it. I was going to kill him. The storm outside picked up. At some points the thunder and wind made the entire building tremble. I didn't want to be inside if the roof came down, but I wouldn't be able to see if I went outside. My stomach was too stressed for dinner. For hours I sat facing the door with a blanket to try and keep away the early spring chill. I planned to stay out here for as long as my food held out for. I didn't need to wait that long. When the storm started to die down an odd smell came into the air. I buried my nose in the blanket trying to avoid it. It grew so strong my eyes started to water before I started to get adjusted to it. When I was younger a trash bag broke when I tried to take it out of the can. Inside were some freezer burn steaks we had thrown out along with other food waste. This smell was similar but much more pungent than days old rotten food sitting in the summer heat. Since the rain died down, I could hear the footsteps from outside getting closer to the door as the smell grew. My fingers tensed ready to draw my weapon. So very slowly the door started to open creaking as it did so. A tall thin figure took a single step inside the cabin. My eyes had long since adjusted to the dark. Because of this, my body froze in fear seeing what had just entered the cabin. He wore scraps of dirty stained clothing. The lips were torn away revealing pale gums. This person had no muscle mass and looked to be a walking skeleton with a thin layer of skin clinging to their bones. Long dirty fingernails gave the bony hands a dangerous appearance. For a moment the eyes appeared to glow white causing my heart to skip a few beats. When it met my eyes, it smiled and inhaled a rancid breath. I snapped out of my trace. Within a second, I threw off the blanket and started firing. Even in the dark, I should have hit him at such a close distance. I lost count of how many times I pulled the trigger. Dark blood that appeared black poured from three bullet wounds on its chest, and yet those long legs covered the distance between us, showing not an ounce of pain. It fell on me. I kicked, threw punches, and did everything I could to get that vile creature away. To my horror, it started laughing. My arms were pinned down by strength it should not possess. I've never felt so scared and helpless before. You smell like her. A low voice rasped. I felt as disgusted as I was angry. I hated this thing with every single fiber. Amused, he brought his face closer. 
The stench was almost overwhelming. Thick blood dripped onto my clothing soaking through. Strangely it felt ice cold. This terrifying creature couldn't be natural. Are you jealous? He spoke through rotten teeth. You loved her, and yet I was the one to eat her. To have her be a part of me forever. Don't you wish it was you? I shut my eyes trying to force back the sheer rage. A chill ran down my back as my mind thought of something I tried to hide from. That I had nothing left of my sister. Everything she left behind didn't feel like hers. Not even the charm I found. She was gone from this world, and I couldn't seem to find anything to hold on to. The sound came from myself I first assumed was a wild animal outside. I forced everything into my arms to throw off this creature. It tried to recover and claw at my face. In my fury, I lashed out and bit down so hard on one of its fingers that my teeth ripped it off. I spat out the foul thing, the blood almost like acid in my mouth. He reeled back in pain long enough for me to grab the blanket. In one swift moment, I tossed it over the creature's face, blinding it long enough to grab the pistol I had dropped in the earlier struggle. Pressing it to the creature's skull under the blanket I fired until it was empty. More dark blood started to soak the material. With burning lungs, I crawled away waiting for the thing to move again. Surely it was dead. It needed to be dead. And yet it sat up, black stained blanket still over its face. Was I just seeing things? Do you still love her? It spoke in a garbled voice. Shut up. I hissed. She's still here. It raised pale thin arms as if trying to offer something. I shook my head trying to refuse what I was seeing. I love you because she loved you. I took her into myself. We can all be together. Don't you want that? Rage boiled over. A heavy-duty flashlight sat waiting on the floor next to my pack. I grabbed it in a blind rage. The first impact against the creature's skull painfully ran up my arm. After that, I don't remember much. Not how many strikes I brought down. Not when the flashlight broke and when I switched to my fists. Or when I broke my fingers from punching down as hard as I could. All while that monster laughed. I eventually collapsed. Body and mind were thin. When I woke the light of dawn crept through the dusty windows. For a moment I thought what happened had been a dream. When I sat up, I found the beaten body of the creature where I left it. I considered burning down the entire cabin with the body inside. My hands were so ruined from the beating that I couldn't light a fire. Instead, I dragged the body into the woods and then kicked leaves to cover as much of him as I could. When my hands were covered, I was coming back to set a much-needed fire. The hike back was brutal. Either I hid my broken hands well, or the owner of the motel didn't care. I knew I couldn't go to a hospital for my injuries. I just collapsed in the motel bed trying to fight back the pain long enough to rest. A few hours later, a knock at the door dragged me from my nightmares. I almost didn't answer it. Just in case there was something wrong with my credit card, I opened the door wondering if I was going to be kicked out. Instead, Ranger Dan was on the other side holding a first aid kit. He silently walked inside. I let him work on the cuts and broken bones, and was relieved it wasn't as bad as it felt. There were two sons you know. He started not looking up from his work. The oldest son wasn't at the cabin with his younger siblings. He blamed himself for what happened and killed his younger brother. Then, the strangest thing started to happen. He grew sickly and distant. Soon, he left town for the cabin where his sisters had died. We all knew something wasn't right with him. But we didn't know how bad it was until the bones missing the marrow showed up after some hikers disappeared over the years. I chewed on my cheek tasting blood. These people had known for years about the monster in the woods, and they had done nothing. My sister, my dear Lexi was dead because of that. I sat grinding my teeth in silent anger. Are you heading home, or somewhere else? The ranger asked in a serious voice. At first, I didn't know what he meant. I had killed what took my sister away, but I didn't feel as if I had a home to return to. It would be impossible to just go back to my regular life after this. He spoke again, and his next question made my body turn cold. Are you hungry? I was starving. Which was to be expected because I hadn't eaten much in almost two days. This hunger was different. It hurt so deep down inside it should be impossible. Like a black hole had opened in my stomach. Why did you never kill what was in the forest? I asked in a shaking voice. For once, he answered my question. It can't be killed. 
He finished up his task and left the room not even looking back. Once he was gone my body started to shake. I was cold. So damn cold. No amount of hot water from the shower helped. Something was wrong with me, and I didn't want to admit it. I'm going back into those woods. I need to burn a windigo. But I didn't want Lexi to have died without anyone knowing what happened to her. I may not be able to come back out of those woods. Honestly, I would like to believe my mind snapped from the intensity of what happened. But didn't people say crazy people don't know they're crazy? I knew the vast empty hunger was insane. I knew this cold running through my body wasn't natural. And I know sane people don't start chewing layers off their lips. I'm scared of what I'm becoming. Crazy or a wendigo. Either way, I love my sister and fire should solve this problem before I pass it on to someone else. Eighth story. Wendigo in my backyard. It was late night. My now boyfriend, I'll call him Jake, and I were getting ready to sleep in an acquaintance's playhouse in her backyard. The structure is about 5 by 8 with 3 windows and a fence directly next to one of the windows. The windows are large and close to the ground. Suddenly, I notice two shadowy figures through the cracks in the fence. I see what appears to be two people standing very close to the fence, about 1.5 feet away from the playhouse. This is near the alley. One is about 5 feet 9 inches and the other 5 feet 2 inches. No details were visible, just silhouettes. Fearing the cops were after him, Jake hides under the blanket and goes to sleep. I grab my knife and begin my vigil, because something told me that wasn't what was out there. Then, the scratching at the bottom of the wall begins. Whatever this was circled the playhouse and aggressively scratched, darn near constantly. It sounded like the size of a raccoon, but I could not despite every effort catch a glimpse. This was bizarre. I spent about two hours listening to this creature sometimes make slow circles, sometimes very quick. I heard it walk on the tiny porch. Meanwhile, the larger figures outside the fence move just enough to know they are alive, but never step away from where they were standing. At first, I was paralyzed with fear. This was until I figured that whatever this was, may well smell weakness. So I summoned up every ounce of the willpower I never knew I had. After a bit of wrestling with primal terror, I was calm and ready to fight. Although a bit angry at these fuckers that were invading my property, fence is offset from the alley so there is a nook of grass not visible from much elsewhere. The small creature walked over to the door and seemed to be pawing and sniffing, causing the hinges to rattle, desperately wanting to get to us for whatever reason. The way the window was angled, I should have been able to see it. The only gap in my sight was about the size of a rat. After living in a tent for some time, I know what rats sound like. This one would have to have been extremely rabid and raged out to maintain this loudness and not give up. We had no food or aromatic drinks. Rabid rats at that stage would tend to blunder, and this thing was doing anything but that. It was focused. Also, it didn't make any noise other than scratching. I would expect hissing, or at least an errant squeak. This continues for around an hour. Sometimes I move around and look out at weird angles trying to determine what the hell this is. Jake, lucky enough he is, is a heavy sleeper and was under a lot of blankets so didn't wake up. Later, the sounds got steadily louder and started expanding, for lack of a better word. That crescendoed an aggressive scratching completely surrounding the playhouse, all the walls and roof, for more points than I could count. Still able to see nothing. My psyche was on fire, but not with fear somehow. I accepted death. I became euphoric for a few minutes as I figured I should enjoy my last time on earth. The blazing joy faded, but I remained calm and happy. The scratching calmed down, and after about half an hour, it petered out. The figures outside the fence were gone, but they hadn't been for long. I didn't see them leave because I was probably watching out one of the other windows. I woke up Jake because I wanted the help of a man to be on alert and defensive, because I thought they hadn't gone far yet. We had been good friends for a couple years. At that time, him and I had been growing closer romantically, but only for a bit more than a week. I swallowed my pride because now or never was the time for the truth, and said, I love you. He said it back, and I was so relieved and happy. I racked my brain, and neither him nor I can think of any logical explanation other than a creature not yet known to science. He heard the scratching before he fell asleep, but at that point it wasn't alarming. He agreed that it was about four hours from when he fell asleep to when he woke up. 
The scratching never ceased for more than a minute or two during that time. On another night when he was camping with his friend, he heard aggressive, loud, and unexplainable noises of a much more dramatic nature. But this is a story for another time. Suffice to say we believe there are cunning, hungry beasts with vocal, athletic, and sensory capabilities beyond imagination. These and other errant bizarre sounds remind us of stories of Wendigos. I dread to think, but the figures outside the fence I could have just been one. The shorter one being the hind legs and the taller one being the front. The top of the figures were in shadow. If that is the case, it was could have been throwing its voice and creating the scratching noises itself. Three creatures or one. Theoretically, it could have been a rabid rat that just happened against all odds to stay out of sight, and I went into psychosis when I heard it all around me. But neither I nor my family has any history of hallucinations. I believe that I remain too composed to imagine such a thing. The figures could have been cops after him or robbers hiding out coincidentally at the exact time. I don't think so though. Thank God these creatures sensed that we were not to be trifled with and wouldn't go down without a fight. I used to be a scaredy cat about every noise at night. My mindset towards this and life in general has improved since then because I realize I am capable of much more mental strength than I believed. Ninth story. Something's watching me in the woods. Before I begin the encounter, I would like to provide backstory. I live in Pennsylvania, and during this particular encounter I was at my aunt's. She has three kids and her house is about three to five miles down a remote dirt road off of a highway through the rural area. She is approximately 25 minutes away from a store and 35 away from police. And before I start, understand that I do not usually believe in supernatural things. It was about two to four months ago, I was at my aunt's for a birthday party. Got there at around 2 p.m. and by 7 p.m. we were ready to leave. My cousins, her kids, asked if I would stay over because they don't see me very often. I agreed, as I also would enjoy time with them. So, after the party, and after everyone had left, it was my aunt, her three kids, and her husband and I. My aunt and uncle went to bed at around 9.30 to 10 p.m. I stayed up with the youngest cousin, who we will call Amy. Amy and I were in the living room watching some criminal minds, up until around 11 p.m. She decided to go to bed, and I stayed up watching the show. Mind you, it is now pitch black outside and I am in the middle of the woods. For this factor, they had motion-activated lights outside. As I was watching television on the couch, which was against the window, I noticed that the light outside turns on. My heart is beating seeing as it's the middle of the woods and people should not be around the house. I looked out, and it luckily was just a deer about 20 to 30 feet out by the tree line. Since it was only a deer, I went back to watching my show, of course the deer was cute, nothing to be worried about, right? Five minutes pass by, and the light shuts off. Still watching Criminal Minds, I gather my blankets and pillows to get ready for bed as I was sleeping in the living room that night. As I'm setting the pillows on the couch and laying the blanket down, a sudden bright flash startled me. It's the motion-activated light outside of the living room window. Before I even looked, I thought to myself that it was just the deer again. However, I looked out again reluctantly, but there was nothing there. At this point, it was 11.45, almost midnight, and I'm yawning. I go back to organizing my sleep space, and not even 30 seconds later I hear something clank the window that I had just observed out of. Once again I turn to check out what the hell just hit the window, and what I saw. I can't even explain rationally. Off to the side by the tree in the yard was the deer again. However it wasn't the same deer. It looked deformed, almost malnourished, stomach extremely sunken in, and barely any fat on the animal. It just stood there, looking straight at me. It felt like it was staring into my soul almost. This deer, if it could even be called a deer, made me feel extremely unsettled and I did not feel safe. What I saw next made my stomach sink to my feet. The malnourished deer that made me feel such a foreboding and disturbed feeling contorted and ran off on two legs. Two, it went into the woods, out of my sight. By this time I'm absolutely freaking out. My heart is racing and I'm the only one awake. I immediately closed the curtains, ran to make sure the doors were locked, and I sat away from the window. Trying to process what I had just seen was troubling. No matter how much I thought about it, I could not rationalize what I saw. This deer, literally skin and bone, 
contorted and folded in ways that are not even capable with normal joint function. The way it ran off on two legs, the way it stared at me before all of it happened. I don't understand it. I did not sleep that night. I ended up going to my aunt's bedroom, telling her what I had seen. She did not believe me and told me, you're just tired so you're seeing things. I can tell you, with 100% certainty, that I saw what I saw. After that night, I refused to stay at my aunt's anymore. And if we would go there for a party, we made sure we left before dusk. I've heard other stories from locals in the area from when they were hunting. I remember one mentioning a tribe, or cult, that lived in the area off the beaten path. Maybe it was one of them and I just was tired. Maybe not. If anyone has had anything similar, please let me know. I feel crazy because I haven't found anything similar, and I can't even talk about it to people because they will think I'm on drugs. Tenth story. I'll never go hunting again. I am a bow hunter, and I like to still hunt. Which is when you dress in full camo and walk through the woods rather than sit in a tree stand. Last. October I was coming down a hill into a marshy area, it was kinda late, and enough, so that the side of the mountain was covered in shadows. I live in PA where our mountains are completely covered in trees, and it gets dark fast. When I get to the bottom of the hill, I notice that it was completely silent, no sounds at all, and I felt the hairs stand on my arms, but I've been creeped out before in the woods, so it wasn't too big of a deal, I kept on. I've been hunting in this general area before, but I've never went down this hill. I continued creeping through the woods, mind you I am walking very slow, so you can barely hear my footsteps because deer are hard to sneak up on. And then I hear a voice call out for me from behind a thicket of small trees, help, my name, come over here, I'm in trouble, help. And I swear to God it was my brother's voice, but my brother lives in Nevada, so it couldn't be my brother and it said my name. It only took me a second to realize something wasn't right. And when I did I ran faster than I ever have in my life. Only my dad knew where I was hunting that day. And the area is huge no one would have found me there. And he is too old to have played any tricks on me. But something out there knew my name. And it sounded just like my brother. I don't know the hell that was. But I don't think I'll ever be going back to the woods again. Maybe I'll move to the desert with my brother. Where at least I can see everything around me. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.